Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the human side of the Columbia mission panel. My name is Pini Gurfil. I'm the director of the Asher Space Research Institute here at the Technion and the chair of the local organizing committee of SSP 16. Uh, I would like to start by introducing our panelists for tonight. Ms. Rona Ramon, chairman of the board of directions, the Ramon Foundation. Please welcome Ms. Ramon. Jonathan Clark, Baylor College of Medicine, Assistant Professor of Neurology and Space Medicine. <laughs> Doug Hamilton, University of Calgary, Associate Professor, former flight surgeon for the Canadian Space Agency. <laughs> and John Conley, ISU, SSP Director, NASA Exploration, Missions, and Systems. <laughs> space Shuttle Columbia, Columbia's STS-107 mission was a milestone for space life sciences, but the uh, mission's vast accomplishments were overshadowed by the tragic end of the mission. Embedded within this mission are many human stories, not only of the crew, but of the thousands of people on Earth whom the story and mission touched. This exceptional panel brings together four individuals who will uh, share their human stories of Columbia's last mission. Ron Ramon and Jonathan Clark share the most personal connection to the mission. Their spouses, Israeli Air Force officer Elon Ramon and NASA astronaut Laurel Clark were two of the victims lost on the flight. Doug Hamilton was a flight surgeon who worked with the crew and participated in the recovery. And John Conley led one of the many teams who searched 3,000 square miles of East Texas in an attempt to recover the remains. The human stories of the Columbia range from the seven families of the STS-107 to the mission's flight controllers and support staff to the 20,000 22,000 individuals who would take part in the largest search and rescue mission in the history of spaceflight. The number of individuals touched by the loss of the seven crew members made the Columbia mission a truly human story. Lady, lady and gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thank you, Peeney. When we think of the uh, Columbia mission, many of us think of the highlights that we see on television all the time. But behind those highlights are hundreds and hundreds of human stories. And what we, what we would like to do tonight is we would like to tell you some of those human stories. And uh, the stories go not only from the crew members and their families, but uh, to the flight controllers, to the flight surgeons, to the people who, uh, who are part of the search and rescue effort. And uh, None is more personal than the stories that uh, Rona and John have to, store, have to share with us. So uh, we'd like to start at the beginning, when the crews first met each other. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, what it was like when you two first met and, and when uh, Elon and Laurel first met. So you dig your, your memories. <laughs> um, I'm actually, Hello, everyone, and good evening. Um, I can't recall the exact first minute that we got together, but um, what was so special about the crew and uh, for us as spouses to be uh, together, uh, we became like a big family. And uh, we were unusual crew because we had uh, 12 children in our, uh, in our uh, crew members. And you know the majority of the children were mine. Uh, I had four and John had one. And uh, it was beautiful because it was always uh, very vivid and uh, the children enjoyed each other uh, uh, culture. And it was, um, that's the beauty of, uh, of this group, that they really felt like a family. And um, this is what the most special thing 
that each meeting that we had as a crew and the families, it was a very warm and very happy meetings to get together. Right, John? Well, it, it's just such an honor to be here at the Technion and the ISU uh, Space Studies program of the summer. This is such an important venue, and to have a talk uh, like this, which is obviously going to be, you know, emotional for us, is uh, it's to, for us to share this, uh, this ex the human side of the space program, and hopefully this will touch the younger ones in the audience who can carry the torch and keep this, uh, you know, this passion to, to, to explore and do great things going. Um, yeah, so it, it's interesting. I, I had a very unusual position because um, my wife was an astronaut and I worked at NASA. Originally I was an, uh, a Navy uh, captain there and then I went and became a civil servant. And th th you probably don't know this, but um, I did a launch physical when he first showed up. And it, this was several years before the original launch date, which was 2000. So this was probably 1998 and there was... Uh, Alon and, and a backup uh, um, uh, mission specialist, and also an Israeli flight surgeon. Uh, and they, they came down, and so I did Alon's physical and the other guys. And I remember my impression with, of Alon, and I was a flight surgeon in the military, so I was used to dealing with military pilots, but the, the, he, he touched me. It, it, you could feel a presence of something very special with him. He, he carried himself uh, gracious, humble, um, but, but a, 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 a burning curiosity and, and a, um, a timeless sense of humor. I mean, he just had this beautiful uh, ability to, to, to make you laugh in, in funny ways. And so I was really blessed because I, I met him before he ever was really even integrated with the crew. And, and then lo and behold, you know, Laurel got assigned and, and it was like, wow, you know, I had this, you know, this wonderful experience. So. Um, uh, I just really appreciated the fact that I had such a, a close, you know, connection with, with uh, you and the and the other Columbia families, and uh, it, it's it carried us through these really tough times. If it weren't for the fact that we were a bonded family and a bonded crew, it would have been really hard. It was hard enough, but it was really special because we cared so much and so deeply about others, each other. I uh, met Alon during a simulation. <clears throat> we have uh, an environment that's a simulator that behaves exactly like a shuttle. And uh, if there's going to be a medical scenario in the simulation, a flight surgeon is in the simulator. And so they were all taking turns at the kitchen, the galley, heating up food and having their lunch, and I was uh, starving. And I think Alon could see that I was starving, and I'd, you know, your, your job is to be there, but to be out of the way. So Alon went to Rick's husband and said, um, where's Hammy from? And he said, Canada. What do they like to eat? Well, they like beef. So he went and heated me up some beef stroganoff and came and gave it to me. <laughs> and uh, it was just neat. It was just an incredible gesture. This crew was so together so long because the Columbia had not been uh, upgraded so it could go to the space station. And so this mission was chosen for Columbia to fly. And the space station had a rigorous schedule. And therefore, whenever they had an opportunity to launch, they would get bumped. And so they got bumped for like two years. So this crew spent a lot of time together. And you could tell that by how close they were. That's right. I believe the mission was delayed 18 times, which was a NASA record at the time. So let's talk a little bit about the mission itself. Most people, again, remember what you saw on television, but there were years and years of planning uh, into this mission. It was a, a life science mission, which was very unique for NASA. We, we haven't flown that many of them. And um, so you see uh, behind us here, this is a little card we get. Uh, everyone who works at NASA before every shuttle mission gets a little card describing what the mission is about, uh, what the payload is uh, in the back of the shuttle, and in this case it was the, uh, the space hab. Um, and the shuttle contained also a special kit called an extended duration orbiter kit, which would allow it to stay in space for an extended period of time. So it was meant to be a mini space station uh, of life science experiments and to go into space for an extended time and let the crew uh, perform 
uh, many, many life science experiments without having to go to the space station. So, so this, is what, this is how I first became uh, acquainted with this mission. I was a NASA engineer working on other things, and so this was the card that ended up on my desk that uh, got me interested in the mission. And like most NASA people, uh, anytime there's a shuttle mission, you drop whatever you're doing, you watch the launch, you watch the landing, uh, you pay attention to things that are happening on orbit. So, um, I don't know, do we want to say anything else about the mission, Doug, uh, since it's a life science? Yeah, it was originally supposed to be an artificial gravity mission, but the engineers were having a heart attack over that. So it was converted to a life sciences mission, and not just human science, but a lot of plant and animal experiments and very diverse, and it did require, I think the science was so successful was because the crew was delayed and spent so much extra time training for that. The scientists were over the moon. They wanted to get their research done, but these people knew this equipment so good, so well, and it turned out to be a good advantage because some of it failed on orbit, and they had it apart and they fixed it like nobody's business. I got, my first opportunity was to uh, do some simulations with them. A lot of times the flight surgeons are assigned more than one mission and uh, I would come and fill in on the simulators and I finally got to know the crew more and more. Um, this, this mission um, had some really remarkable uh, science and believe it or not, I'd say 25% of the data for that science we actually got. You'd think it all burned up, it didn't. We have a lot of data that we got that was uh, that downloaded and actually in certain things that were covered on the ground. If I may add, um, the committed um, experiment that came from all over the world, they trained uh, in Europe for, for a few times, went to um, a special simulator over there. And uh, of course there was the Israeli Madex experiment that uh, really had a breakthrough uh, scientists uh, uh, really love the, the experiment and the results of it. As, as for my knowledge, uh, they presented 83 um, experiment for all mankind, of course, and they were divided to different uh, uh, subjects. And from the crew side of them, they really did a fantastic work. They worked on all the experiment. Um, Again, I think that there was 80% of the knowledge of the data that came down at the real time, which allows researchers to continue to work on, on the same data that they got at that time. So it was very special, and they really loved the challenge of uh, doing those experiments. This also was unique in that the scientists were almost family to this crew also, because they had spent so much time with them. And that little figure predominated predominantly if we get into the mission. Um, this particular, there we go, hello. I'm, I'm just gonna turn this down. So, when a shuttle launches, it speeds and accelerates, but the air doesn't get thin fast enough. So the forces on the vehicle are very strenuous. So then the vehicle has to slow down its rocket engines to get through that part of the atmosphere. Once they're through that part of the atmosphere, they turn the engines up to 105%. They get, they get beyond what's called max Q, and that turn on those engines. And that's when a small piece of foam broke off the vehicle and hit the wing. So they get to max Q in less than a minute. They're going faster than the speed of sound. They eventually will get to 17,500 miles per hour, or five miles per second. And they do that in eight minutes. Now about 82 seconds into the flight, they'll be at about 20 kilometers altitude and uh, going about 840 meters a second. And that's when a piece of foam broke loose from the big orange tank. We've seen pieces of foam break loose from the, the tank before. Sometimes they do a little bit of damage to the shuttle. Um, we didn't think that this piece of foam was any different than others. 
um, until we really started looking at it uh, a little later. So, John, do you want to talk a bit about the in-family problem? Because you're the expert on it. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, and I was a shuttle crew surgeon, and, and both Doug and I worked uh, uh, 107, but um, there had been a recurring problems, and because there was never a bad outcome, uh, the problems were trivialized or minimized. And I think uh, that's a lesson that we've carried now, that any problem you know, that occurs needs to be really dug down into. The idea was that a piece of foam, what could that do? It's like you're driving down the road and somebody's, um, you know, ice cooler, you know, uh, just the foam ice cooler comes off and you hit it with your car and it's no big deal. But the fact is that for those of you that have a physics background, it's the, you know, it's the kinetic energy is related to the velocity squared. So going at, uh, you know, I think it was 700 miles an hour, that foam, that a uh, pound and a half piece of foam uh, had enough energy that when it hit the leading edge of the wing, it punched a hole as big as your head through that wing. And it turns out when they looked at the foam strikes that had been occurring, um, they had lost big pieces of foam and they had done some damage, but um, there wasn't enough damage for this to be a problem. Uh, so they just said, well, on this mission, um, it'll, it'll be that we have to repair the vehicle when it gets back, but it won't be a big deal. And the fact is that now we realize that this foam was the Achilles heel of the, the shuttle program, and it ultimately ended up in why it was, it was uh, you know, um, canceled or, you know, it, it reached its uh, end of life. So the, the take-home point there is that don't, don't let things that uh, seem like a problem just go you know, by the wayside, look into it, make sure that it really is, you know, is, a, 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 you know, safe or not. And that was something that NASA, everybody that was involved in that is going to carry for the rest of their lives. The psychologists referred to this as normalization of deviance. If you see something that's wrong enough times, you just begin to accept that it's right. And this was ultimately uh, what happened uh, both uh, on Challenger and Columbia. So the... the uh, the foam <coughs> hit a part of the wing that gets the hottest as the vehicle re-enters. And it has special, a special coating, if you will, a special uh, layer of tile, which is very thin, maybe the thickness of two picnic paper plates, very fragile. So this hard foam hit the worst place on the vehicle, the thinnest place and also the place that gets hard. These, this wing will glows red hot as the vehicle comes in. And so now the vehicle is going to be exposed to that, to that source of heat, but it won't be able to uh, stop it. What it does is that the leading edge heats up so hot, it re-radiates the energy back out and doesn't let it go through. And uh, that's how the thermal tiles work. The thermal tiles on the other part of the vehicle have the consistency of styrofoam like your styrofoam coffee cup, you can scratch it with your fingers. And so John and I noticed several times when we, we would walk with the crew after the mission, we'd go under the vehicle and there would be hundreds of little tiny specks where it looked like the vehicle had been shot with a shotgun. Not, and some were big divots, but we never really noticed anything too close to what we call the RCCs, uh, which was the, the leading edge panels. So Columbia arrived on orbit, damaged, and we didn't know it. Uh, and the mission just continued normally. So there's, a, there's an astronaut looking at the tiles. There's 20,000 tiles. They're all different. And uh, they've all been mounted very specially. And there's a picture of the tile there. And it's, it's light. That thing weighs a couple grams. It's extremely light. And so it's very fragile. I want to talk a bit about the, the tank? Okay, so this uh, is a little more detail about where that suitcase size piece of foam came from. The nose of the shuttle attaches up at the top of the big orange tank um, by uh, means of two metal struts called bipods. And to make the tank more aerodynamic, we would put a big block of foam around one of these connections to try to uh, smooth it out for the airflow. Well, this is all done by hand. It's, a cra it's craftsmanship done by very amazing people. And uh, the aerodynamics in this case just uh, knocked a piece loose. 
Uh, so here's a, uh, I think this is a, is this the looping? Uh, no, the next one is. Okay. So this shows a, a detail of where that piece came loose up near the nose of the shuttle and, and how it impacted the, uh, the left wing, uh, right where it changes its angle. So if we could run that, and we'll try to get through this quickly. And part of the, part of the, the reason that they put the foam on is that the inside that tank is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which are many hundreds of degrees below zero. And so uh, any uh, condensate or moisture in the air will freeze and turn into ice. So this is basically like the, you know, your uh, cup holder that keeps your drink from getting a lot of condensate on so it. So you can see the foam breaking off and you see the plume of dust as it shatters on the edge of that wing. Right there. I'm not an engineering or a professional or a scientific, but um, people are asking uh, pretty often if uh, the crew members could have been saved. And I, I really don't know the professional answer, but I do believe that at NASA people they are so talented and so bright that uh, I believe that if they would address the problem as it should have, with all the serious uh, means that they would need, uh, I do believe that if they brought the crew of uh, Apollo 13 back, they might have a chance. And as a human side of the, the story, uh, this is the biggest frustration, that they really didn't did not have a chance to survive. Um, and instead of being the finest hours of, uh, of NASA, the decision making and the addressing of the situation was totally in a different uh, position. We learn about um, those uh, horrible facts um, seven or eight months after the accident that actually happened. And of course, it changed <clears throat> the, all, um, the whole way of looking at the issue. Because again, I'm sitting with, it with such a professional people that knows how to analyze exactly every angle. Every, every, but I do believe that the most important thing is the human side of addressing this kind of operation. That every voice ne needed to be uh, need to be here, uh, here. and uh, of course every idea need to be checked uh, thoroughly and not to be uh, to take everything as a, um, obvious that it happened before so it's fine again as well. The, um, the issue came up in the mission management teams and the thermal protection folks who are responsible for these tiles at that time, I didn't know, but I had divided opinions about whether this was a, a serious strike or not. And uh, the, I guess that went on for the whole mission. Uh, but as a flight surgeon, I wasn't aware of that going on. I guess from my perspective, and I talked about this with John today, uh, I would have liked to have known, and I would have liked, I know, I know Smith Johnson, the lead flight surgeon, would have wanted to know, so that we could think about what we would tell the crew. Maybe we could come up with something to try, and there's been some things suggested. But more importantly, if this was a catastrophic strike, then I would have given them the, it's an extended duration orbiter. We could have given them another three days, and then they would re-enter, John, and what would happen, what would happen. And if we took a, a chance to try and fix it, and there were some ideas, very technical, we don't need to talk about it tonight. But uh, I found out about these ideas you know, after the mission. And as a flight surgeon, I would have wanted them to know. And I would have wanted them to advise us what we should do about it with their families. As a flight surgeon, we could have brought in the behavioral health people and everything to be at that cape, to be ready to support them if something catastrophic did happen. And as a flight surgeon, I wanted to give them the option, and the flight director would have, to let them have that extra three days in space. I was going through some of the uh, mission uh, tapes, and we'll talk to you about that later, and they were 
continually joking with Rommel and all the other guys about getting the mission extended. And you're going to see a recording of Ramon joking about it. It's actually very funny. I think that would have been a very useful thing, but for some reason, NASA management decided to not make that known in the mission uh, management teams. And uh, there was quite a few flight control positions that were kind of upset with that. I've never had a chance to ask them why that decision was made. I think it would raise a, an emotional issue, but anyways, that, that's what I would have liked to have done. So I think from the NASA engineering community, uh, had we known there was a problem, we would have gone into Apollo 13 mode. We would have turned over heaven and earth to try to save this crew. This was a, a shuttle with an extended duration orbiter kit. It could have stayed in space 30 days. In 30 days, we could have turned around Atlantis. Well, we proved for the Hubble repair mission, then you can prepare a shuttle for the Hubble repair mission because of Columbia. See, when you launch, you have the ability to bring the shuttle back to, to the launch site. Or you can land the shuttle across the Atlantic Ocean. Or you can abort to orbit. And you can even go around the Earth once and come back to Kennedy. But if a shuttle gets damaged going up, we came up with a new abort mode, and that was abort to the space station. The crew would go to the space station, and they would uh, live there, suck all the stuff out of the shuttle, throw it away, and we figure a way to get them home. But for the Hubble repair mission, we couldn't do that because of the orbital mechanics. So we were going to let the Hubble die. And what we decided was, we're going to have another shuttle on the other pad ready to go with uh, three or four days' notice. And so, I don't know, I'd like to think that the people down at the Cape, they're smart folks. I'm pretty sure they could have turned that bird around. 21 days. Yeah. We, we probably could have gotten up there with a few days to spare. Yeah. Had we known. Yeah. So... Again, this is all retrospect, and this is all um, after the thought. And you've got to understand, missions are intense, and, and sometimes decisions don't, especially in situations like this. So it was unfortunate. And um, I would have loved to have given them the opportunity to try. Uh, you know, from my perspective, um, I... Uh you know, even though I was, my wife was on the shuttle, um, I got appointed to the Columbia Survival Investigation Team that met from 2004 to 2008. Oh boy. And that was a very uh, in-depth analysis of what happened, how the crew uh, responded, how they, and how they perished. And, and those are actually available publicly as NASA uh, special reports. So my role was to analyze the crew escape uh, component of it and what crews could have done you know differently and coming from the military we always had this attitude you never leave a fallen comrade behind you never give up you never quit uh, even if it's hopeless you you continue to um, press you know, press on and and try to, to save them and I actually was very disappointed because some of the colleagues that I knew at NASA said well there was nothing they could have done and they would have died anyway and it's almost kind of this fatalistic attitude. So after the Columbia survival investigation that I got invited to join these high altitude uh, bailout projects that broke the sound barrier on two different occasions, and there were a lot of people at NASA that said, oh, you're going to kill him, he's going to sh get shattered by the breaking the sound barrier. And there was a, some, some sense of pride in knowing we proved you wrong, and we did it twice. And and I'm here to say that there has been advances in the escape technology that's been directly attributable to Columbia that has advanced crew safety and survivability. It's sad that it had to cost some lives. Um, I always like to think, you know, if, we, if we'd known and we tried, we would at least had a fighting chance. Because giving up and saying you can't do anything, your chance of success is zero. And anything is better than zero. So should we talk a little bit about uh, the mission itself while it was on orbit sure. or um, before we um, 
go to uh, well, the Well, this is a, a picture of well, the way the shuttle is coming in on that purple line. And this is where it would have gone right down to the Cape. That was the path. And we've done this so many times before it was routine. But in mission control, you can see there's yellow dots, and that's the vehicle coming in, following the, the green line. And we started to see abnorm ab abnormalities in the data flow coming from the vehicle. We're gonna talk a bit about that later. But you can see the dots stopped coming, and all the displays went static. And that's when we found out that the vehicle had broken up and that it wasn't gonna to go to the Cape. And so these two folks were waiting at the Cape with their families. Maybe you can talk about what happened then. Or do you wanna move on? We can move on. Uh, we, we were standing by the runways. Um, a very small uh, group of people uh, consider the big uh, celebration of the launch. We really wanted to um, make a homecoming and welcome our loved ones in a private family uh, mood. So we were there. <clears throat> and um, during the whole mission, uh, NASA is uh, keeping the NASA challenge, uh, channel. Is, um <coughs> I, I forgot this word. But the NASA challenge is uh, showing all the time the crew in, the, in, in orbit. So we definitely have the communication for, for 16 days in a row. And then we're arriving and we're listening to the communication with the shuttle in the big speakers. And I remember that all of a sudden it was quiet in the speakers. And Lonnie told me, Lonnie, uh, Willie McCool's uh, wife told me there's something there's, we can't hear them and the minute there was silent in the speakers there was noise in the audience but as John said um, we were still smiling and hoping and uh, holding to, to the minute that we'll hear the noise again and we'll, we'll see uh, our loved ones arriving but we holding up to the hope even when the, um, the clock went down to the zero and even when they took us to uh, the mission control, we were still hoping uh, because the other option, as John said, is not optional. We do not want to accept that something else happened. That's why we, we have to listen to the very precise words that say, that reality change, that uh, we lost our loved ones and we need to start something new without them. So it was very tough uh, situation of uh, really not knowing what, what's happening. Even when I asked again and again, John had quite knowledge and experience with landing and, but for us it was the first time to see a launch and um, asking again and again what's the problem, what's happened, and until the final answer arrived, we were still hoping. Yeah, I, I had a weird position because I know what the shuttle landings are like because I've been at so many of them to support landings as a flight surgeon, and um, during the descent there was a, a communication between Mission Control in Houston and the shuttle, and uh, there was a message from the capsule communicator that said to the commander, Rick, husband, Rick, we copy your tire pressure alarm. And I thought, hmm, that's not normal. And then there was static. The, count, the clock, which counts down to landing, reaches zero. Ordinarily, you'll hear a, they come through the sound barrier about 100,000 feet, and you hear a, it's like when a jet breaks the sound barrier, you hear a boom, boom like a shotgun blast, and the car alarms go off and everything. No shotgun blast, no sound barrier broken. Countdown clock goes over, so I'm thinking, tire pressure alarm, they had something go wrong, they probably bailed out. That was what I was thinking. 
So when we get back, they rush us back to mission con or to the uh, crew quarters, and I, I I had a key to the flight surgeon's office there, and so I went in there and I turned the TV on and I saw the breakup that was on the t a Dallas TV channel, and then shortly afterwards the head of the um, astronaut office, Bob Cabana, came in and told us the crew was lost and there no chance of recovery, even though they hadn't really confirmed it. And then I remember this massive wail of crying, you know, and, and it was this kind of everybody hugging each other and just, you know, it was really emotional. I mean, it was incredible how, um, how sad it was. And maybe five minutes later, the kids are playing in the other room like nothing happened and the adults are crying and you know it was really a, a very emotional time I mean more than I, I I can't imagine how anybody could have felt that you know you knew they were gone and you didn't want to believe it um, uh, and then they uh, just they weren't sure what to even do with us right. uh, because the plan was you know we would the crew would come back we'd spend a few days at the beach and then go back to Houston and now we had to you know, like, before we knew it, we were on a, we were on, uh, you know, the small Gulfstream business jets taken, going back to Houston, and uh, nobody knew, you know, what, what was really going on. I mean, it was really a, uh, a, a really a kind of a terrifying time. Chaotic time, for sure. The, um, I was in mission control that terrible day, and um, <clears throat> I have to comment that how professional they behaved. They went through the Red Book. They did their procedures appropriately. There was no running. Um, it was pretty amazing. And a lot, some of those flight controllers were very young and probably hadn't experienced death and never anything quite like this. And uh, we had two problems. We had to go and do a crash investigation and figure out what happened. But we, well, we just lost the main supply line to the space station. And we had to report to the president that night the status of the space station. So half of the mission control was starting the investigation, gathering the data, and the other half was scrambling to figure out what we were going to run out first. And at 11.30, working with the environments folks, we calculated that they're going to run out of water in May and that we have to go down to a two-person crew. And we were totally going to be reliant on the Russians to get to the space station for most likely the next two years. So I was watching the, the entry from my house. <clears throat> Being a good NASA engineer, I watch every launch and landing. And, um, and my wife was asking me about, you know, this is taking off a long time. And if you, if you know about the physics of a shuttle landing, it's, it's almost exactly 60 minutes from the deorbit burn to landing. And in 60 minutes after the deorbit burn, the shuttle is going to be on the ground somewhere. And uh, that time came and went, and, and we turned on a few other TVs. We saw what was happening. The, uh, the immediate response of the NASA community was to go to work. It you was know? a Saturday. Yeah, we, it's, it was a Saturday, but we got to be at work. We got to do something. Everybody showed up at work. And uh, I think the first thing I did was uh, I got put on a telephone bank with people calling in from all over the country, you know, who had seen bits of something fall in their backyard and and then before we knew it uh, we were sent up uh, into the field to start picking up some of that debris. We had in uh, Mission Control a link called OIS-163 and it's a reliable link between the Cape and, and Houston because John and I trained for incidents that would involve a crash at the Cape or a bailout over the ocean and so we only needed one line but we never anticipated that we would have multiple government agencies and tons of civilians calling in on this one loop. And when we trained, I, we, I got to the point that I could listen to five conversations at the same time. There are thousands of loops that you can dial into. But I, there were so many people on these loops and they're reporting crew remains, they're reporting parts, they're reporting big tanks spewing out gas. They were just flooding in. Over four states, we had aircraft carriers launching fighter jets to vector towards this. It was just uh, difficult to control. My biomedical engineers were really young, and uh, they did such a marvelous job. 
and Jeff, Jeff Young was the head of them. And they stood their posts and, and, and did, you know, something that was remarkable. Um, let's just move on. Those are the, some of the pictures that we saw. This is actually a weather radar. And that streak is actually the aluminum that's breaking off from the vehicle, reflecting the radar back. Yeah, you could actually see it move over the yeah. time frame, you yeah. know, as, as the wind blew it down and it descended. So as John's group and 20,000 others start to pick up, pick up pieces, we identified that the, the left wing hit the ground first, right? That was, those are the components. And so it sort of gave us a clue that it was a failure of the left wing and it was the left wing that got hit by the foam. Every, every shuttle tile has an identifier on it. And you know which ones come from the left wing, which ones come from the right. And so we started seeing the pieces of the left wing um, further to the west than uh, any other pieces of the shuttle. And that gave us a clue that it, it was something that had to do with the left wing. And Texas is a huge state. And there were four others. And so th there's one strip right there, 500,000 acres that was searched by people three feet apart. John's going to tell you about that. Here you go, John. Oh, there we are. Um, we had 22,000 people that we got on the ground in a big hurry. Most of them are forest firefighters, uh, guys who normally put out forest fires. Um, and of those, most of them were American Indians, some of the finest people I've ever met. And uh, those 22,000 people, you know, spread out in a line one meter apart, and you take one step forward, You'd look at everything around you. If you didn't see anything, you'd take one more step forward and you'd move on. We did this through almost 3,000 square kilometers, uh, all, all by hand, all on foot, with another 9,000 square kilometers searched by air. It was, it was just a massive number of people. And uh, we did manage to retrieve, I believe, 84,000 pieces of the shuttle. Yeah, that was like 38%. Now, that slide there previously, it, it wasn't just grass fields. It was really thick bramble, swamp. thickest swamp. swamps. I mean, you couldn't walk a foot ahead without getting tangled by briars, and it, and it was rainy, and it was an incredibly awful experience for the crews out there. And this, this was the nicest field we ever had <laughs> on the nicest day. Yeah, they had really mad bulls, you know. It was really, really scary. It was a helicopter, helicopter accident. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, so this is your crew. Oh, yeah, there's, there's me and my crew. Uh, so I was one of many, many crews. And uh, you were assigned 40 uh, firefighters, and you were given a, a grid square somewhere in Texas that you'd never been before. And it was your job to uh, cover that that day. And however many hours that took, uh, that's how long these guys stayed out. And, and they were just amazing, like, like John and Doug said, they would, they would crawl through swamps and growth and push through briar patches and, uh, and battle with uh, cattle uh, who weren't very happy to see us in the fields. And uh, we, we picked up, um, well, it was almost like it had rained pieces of the shuttle in places. Every step you take forward, you'd find something. And uh, these guys helped us uh, bring bring 40% of Columbia home. I don't know if you're going to play the tape of the 911 calls, but yeah, I will. oh my god, it's the, the, instead of the sonic booms coming over Florida, there were sonic booms over East Texas, but they didn't come down in a in a the boom boom fashion. It was like a freight train falling from the sky. And uh, people were terrified because these things sounded like explosions and and they were actually seeing and finding uh, these big metal pieces and like you see in this picture here, in, you know, on streets and backyards and it was, uh, it was really amazing. Um, the people there, how they quickly they responded and started to, you know, bring food and, you know, provide support for all the, the search and recovery forces. So in the hangar and at the Cape, they laid out a grid pattern, and as pieces came in, they would map it out.
You want to comment on this one, John? Well, this just shows uh, we had these maps that they would give us every day, and they uh, they showed uh, what pieces we had found and um, and how complete they were. And you could see on the left wing, uh, right where it sort of changes from the chine to the delta, um, there's a missing um, piece of that uh, wing leading edge, and that's that's sort of the one that we were looking for, and that's. Uh, So after analyzing all the different cameras and just doing some computational fluid dynamics with supercomputers, um, they pushed the trajectory of this piece of foam and they figured out that it was either R <coughs> reinforced carbon, carbon uh, RCC panel seven or eight. And so they, were really, they really wanted to find those panels because that was important. Well, we're going to show you evidence that it was indeed those panels, but when we did that, in the Smithsonian Institute is the Enterprise, and the Enterprise is a shuttle that never went to space. It was used to be launched off a of 747 to practice how you would land the shuttle, because the shuttle has no engines when it's land. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a very good glider, so you only have one chance to land it. Right? So these, 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 uh, these astronauts practice and practice and practice because they know it's only one chance. So they built this giant air gun to take a piece of foam that size and fire it at one of the RCC panels they got from Enterprise. They didn't need to put an RCC panels on Enterprise because Enterprise was never going to be thermally challenged. But they did. So we went, they went in there and they stole those panels and they put them there. So now you're going to see in real time what that piece of foam did. Boom. Now here's a slow motion picture. It's a piece of, it's a piece of styrofoam. It's a couple of pounds of styrofoam. But at, at 700 and miles an hour, is the inside view. it just shattered the, the leading edge of the wing. Now, there was some imaging done on reentry, and you can see that the left wing has a malformation. And these pictures were found, you know, they were discovered after the, the, the accident. Now, serendipity is a funny thing. Columbia was an old vehicle, and the shuttles were experimental. And so we put these recorders in the shuttle, and we recorded more than 200 sensors on the left or the right wing, depending on which vehicle. But when the vehicles got upgraded to, to go to the space station, they took those recorders out. They took them out. But Columbia still had theirs. It was an old-fashioned reel-to-reel tape recorder that recorded all the sensors. In serendipity, the, it was instrumenting the left wing. So it recorded all these extra sensors in the left wing. In serendipity, we found that recorder in a Louisiana swamp in perfect condition. It was not a crash-worthy recorder. It's not like an airplane uh, no, it's just flight a data recorder. It's, this is not cr a crash-worthy uh, system. So we had all this data, and then what it allowed us to do was to find out, and you're going to see a video of the flight control room trying to piece together why all these sensors and what's going on. And we finally figured out that the sensor, the one that, it all, it's all because the red cable you see melted first. Every time we take the shuttle <coughs> and, and, and turn it around, we open up the wing and there, take pictures and we check everything. And you do what's called closeout photos. Because the cabling is not identical with, e with each shuttle. It's a little bit different. And so we could determine now, based on which sensors went offline and when, even after we lost communication, what cable melted first and then that. And this is the only place that you could melt these cables and get the sensor failures that we saw. So we definitely knew it was the RCC-8 panel that failed. And as it came in, and we did a lot of computational fluid dynamics, we could model how the hot plasma. Plasma is a fourth state of matter. You can heat up ice to become liquid, and you can heat up liquid to become gas, and you can heat up gas to become plasma. 
And plasma is where electrons and ions live independently. It's highly corrosive. And you, there's only certain materials that can withstand it. And the leading edge of RCC panels are one. So that gaping hole exposed the aluminum of the wing to, to, the, to, the, to this plasma. And it slowly burned a hole through that wing and eventually melted the wing. And the wing tipped a bit and changed the lift characteristics and the vehicle became unstable. And that's when, uh, when you're going at, you know, 10,000 miles an hour, uh, you develop what's called a, a symmetrical shock waves. But the minute the vehicle becomes, becomes unsymmetrical, the shock waves line up and cross each other, and they're called shock-shock interactions, and then they slice through anything. The first shock shot went, 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 went through the bottom and decompressed the vehicle and the mid-deck floor collapsed. And, and the, the, uh, the air was immediately re removed. And consciousness was maybe five to 10 seconds. We do this with our training. We, 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 we practice doing decompressions at 40,000 feet and seeing, how, and seeing if we can get our oxygen masks on. So the crew did not suffer. And as a matter of fact, hypoxia, you get really warm and kind of comfortable. So it wasn't, if they had any amount of angst, it wasn't very long. They weren't wearing uh, their helmets, or if they were, their shields were open, and they hadn't got their spacesuits fully uh, donned or uh, assembled. Interesting, these worms lived. And many other experiments, and we found lots of data. It's just one of those things. Now, as a flight surgeon, you get to meet a lot of interesting folks. The guy uh, up there with me holding the 13 is Fred Hayes from Apollo 13. He actually had a, a, a burn over 70% of his body right after Apollo 13. He crashed a uh, World War II aircraft. And they, 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 just, they, they couldn't take themselves to take Freddy out of the car. They, they, they deniffed him. They said, you can't fly anymore. But they didn't disqualify him. And he sort of hung around for quite some time. And then they needed someone to manage the shuttle landing program. So they put Freddy in charge of that to develop the techniques on how to land the space shuttle. And then he retired. But really nice folks. The other man there is Gene Cernan, the last man to walk on the moon. What's really neat is that when John and I would work in the flight medicine clinic, every astronaut that's ever flown comes back for their annual physical. So you'll see you know, Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin or Gene Cernan and just some of these amazing, Jim Lovell, I mean, and you know, you're not supposed to, but you just grill them with questions. <laughs> I asked Neil Armstrong, what was the toughest part of his career, and thinking he was going to talk about Law on the Moon. And he said it was the X-15 program. Now, I, I got to know Rick Husband, the commander, because John's uh, first flight as being a lead flight surgeon and my certification flight was when Rummel, who you're going to see a tape of, was the commander and, uh, and um, uh, Rick was the, uh, was the pilot. So pilots are waiting to become commanders. and. Uh, uh, so the, Julie Payette's in there, she's a Canadian astronaut, and even though I was supporting the American side, they'd asked me to take care of her. The girl there, that's Laura, that's John's uh, wife. I first met Laura in Star City, Russia, where I was the flight surgeon supporting the very first space station crew, and she was in there, she's training for survival training. Uh, there she is in the middle in the Russian vomit comet that simulates gravity, and uh, and there's John and I. Interesting enough, NASA is a place of traditions. So down below you see two people playing poker. Um, they can't launch until the commander loses Texas straight up poker. They've been doing that since Apollo. I was Canadian, I thought I got a lot to learn about these Americans. The school that Ian went to was right across the street from Johnson Space Center. It's probably the only school in America that would turn away astronauts on career day because they have too many of them. 
it was not uncommon for at least a third of the people dropping their kids off to be wearing flight suits. It was a really tight community, a really tight community. Um, it was almost like military because the military folks got transferred everywhere. And so everybody supported everyone. My wife had an incredible support group of people from NASA. John and I uh, took a couple shifts during this mission uh, before he went down to the Cape. And we would sit on console while his wife is floating around. And I call it stupid smile-itis. Because they have this constant smile on their face. They're in space. And uh, I was joking with, uh, with uh, John that, nah, you don't need a private family conference. You've been watching your wife for eight hours. But thank God they did. What a marvelous crew. This is up at the 192 level. This is just, uh, I, no, this is above the 192. It's by the cones. So this is the, the highest level you can go on the launch tower. Uh, and that's where they got some crew photos. This is a sort of a, a, a troop carrier, if you will. It's, got, it's like a tank. And you, if you have a problem on launch, you run out of the shuttle, you jump in this giant um, uh, sort of a cradle, which is on a long rope, a long cable, and you zip down and you land and you can run into a bunker or run in this and drive it to, uh, to a place where you could be saved by a helicopter. Uh, I, I didn't think that was going to be very reliable, getting away from a vehicle. And one astronaut actually drove it into the lake, but we won't mention that astronaut's name. Wasn't part of this crew. Wasn't part of this crew. But we named the lake after that person. Um, <laughs> flight surgeons don't just do simulations. We watch the crew train. We like to see how they interact. And I like to know what they're trained in so I can at least have a competent conversation with them. So I didn't train a lot with the crew, but I did watch them do a lot of IFMs, which are in-flight maintenance procedures and that, because the engineer in me likes to watch that. They were so close. So these are the escape cradles that they jump into, and you can see way down below. I mean, that would be the scariest ride I could imagine. Ooh. That's a beautiful one of KC and Flora. These suits, when you're in them, even for the simulators, get very hot, and you have to wear liquid cooling garments. Rick kept saying this. No matter where, you'll, you'll hear it in one of the videos. It's just, he's Texan. Hmm. Mike was a very quiet man. And Dave was marvelous. Dave was also a physician. So we'd see Laura and Dave at a lot of different meetings involving space medicine. Laura kept doing this to her hair. You're going to see that in the video. This was a, a, a dual shift mission. Most of the shuttle missions, uh, the crew all stay together. But because of the uh, science payloads were so intensive, they actually split the crew and did um, a uh, red shift and a blue shift and yeah. and uh, so Alon was was with uh, with yeah with Laurel and and Rick and uh, Casey um, and then the other guys were the basically the night shift which made it we had to double our flight surgeon power because normally we have shifts and then we have a planning shift where the while the crew is sleeping mission control is figuring out what we're going to do the next day and what changes so we had the uh, almost a continuous planning shift yeah, because the crew, there was always crew awake, you know, 24 hours a day instead of an eight-hour sleep period. Look at that. Stupid smile-itis. There's their sleeping base. Rick actually... Um, a couple times slept through the wake-up. They play wake-up music. And uh, they, they actually slept very well. There's lots of crews that actually don't sleep well in those things. But uh, Dave and Rick, a couple of times, slept through the music, and the rest of the team just let them go. <laughs> and this is a video. This is a video of them in the cabin during reentry. 
This tape was recovered by a lady who found it in the parking lot of one of the towns in Texas. They're still waitless. You're going to see flashes in the window, and that's plasma hitting the vehicle. See? Yeah, it's like a flashbulb going off. There, see? They comment that, gee, I sure hope uh, we're not out there. Now they're feel, feeling gravity. Uh, I got a bit slipped here on the XL now. Yep. Alright, we're at uh, hundredth of a G. Alright, we're at the This is amazing, it's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yep. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. Yeah, they're that doing was about, prophetic. They're doing about 10,000 miles an hour, 12,000 miles an hour there. This is inside Mission Control. You're going to hear. Action GNC, you ready? Right, back, we're ready. GNC's go. And we're ready, Willie. No deltas. Copy that delta. Now the flight controllers are going to start to report problems. And I know Leroy. Whenever Leroy's thinking hard, he's rubbing his face. So the line shows that they're off the coast of California coming in, and there are various parameters that you see on the display that tell uh, the flight control team how the vehicle's doing. Rick, we're ready for Ops 304. Go ahead, Max. FYI, I've just lost four separate uh, temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle, uh, hydraulic return temperatures. Two of them on system one and one in the, each of systems two and three. Four high return temps? To the left outboard and left inboard elevator. Okay, is there anything common to them, DSC or MDM or anything? I mean, you're telling me you lost them all at exactly the same time. No, right? not exactly. They were within probably four or five seconds of each other. Okay, where are those? Where is that instrumentation located? They're all four of them are located in the uh, aft part of the left wing, right in front of the elevons, elevon actuators. So the wing's been no violated. Commonality. No commonality. So and that cable's melting now. Mission control is usually a very which systems are for? quiet place. It's all three hydraulic systems. And, um, when it gets real chatty, and two of them it's left inboard. never a really good sign. So now they're over the um, eastern... Uh, New Mexico, just before entering uh, the, the Panhandle at everything Dallas went, or uh, to you, uh, Texas. Control and rates and everything is nominal, right? See, Control's been stable to the uh, rolls that we've uh, done so far. Fly, we have good trims. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. Okay. The uh, tires feeling no heat pressure on left outboard and left inboard both tires. In Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure copy. messages, and we did not copy your last. Is it instrumentation, Max? Uh, by Max, no, those are also off. Roger. Off. Okay. That was the last thing we heard at the Cape. Flight income? Yeah. Go. Yeah, we're just taking a few hits here. We're right up on top of the tail. Not too bad. He knows something's wrong. He's trying to figure it out. Hydraulic return instrumentations. Uh, no, sir, there's not. We've also lost the uh, nose gear down talk back and the right main gear down talk back. And flight ECOM? ECOM. I've got four temperature sensors on the bottom line data that are off scale low. Flight ECOM, I didn't expect uh, this bad of a hit on COM. No onboard system can fake changes right before we lost data. That's correct, flight. All look good. Still all on string two and everything looked good. Columbia, Houston, COM check. That's Scorch. She's uh Final one you expecting tracking. Now they're I trying to go flight. Now they're trying to reacquire the vehicle. They can't communicate. Can't you see no C band yet? 
We do not have any valid data at this time. Okay. That we can go to. Let me start talking flight, my navigator. Phil, Phil Inglehoff behind him is going to find out, and you'll see him I'm tell Leroy. Everyone's trying to figure out. We got back rooms looking at this, and here's Phil having to tell Ellen. Look at her face. So now he has to tell Leroy why he can't hear the shuttle anymore. So immediately Leroy goes into the Red Book procedures. The first thing is you lock the door, and then you lock down everything. You don't change anything. And we've got a very thick book on how to do the crash investigations. GC flight. GC flight. Why do you say lock the doors? Copy. Fido, do you have any tracking? No, sir. My Fido. No. My C bands uh, have not required anything. Location of your emergency. I can barely hear you. My name so is this Robert. is uh, the you know, East Texas uh, area of 911 calls. An explosion? That's what it sounds like. Okay, you don't know where it's coming from? No, ma'am. It, it is blocking the area. You know, I just asked what that noise was myself. We are on this pillar. Is something blowing up? I don't know. Hold on one second. Hello? Hey. hey. You're getting calls about this flying yeah. object. About a flying object? Yeah, blowing up. Yeah, we're getting calls about the blowing up. Okay, we, we've had one and we're thinking it's possibly a meteor. We've also heard it's a plane. Okay. All right. Do you have any particular area? Hold on. What's the area, Jack? Back location where you're on. Where? I'm sorry. 343. Okay, hold on one second. Hello? Oh, Crystal? Yeah. This is Carrie. What's this, fella? I, I don't know. Hold on, Carrie. Negative choice, purpose. Crystal? Let me know. Hold on one second. The amazing fact is that the debris fell in a population area. Population area. Very populated area. And it was like a miracle that no one on the yeah. ground was hit by the debris that fell from the sky. There were tanks of toxic propulsion that if you breathe them in, you would die. What we learned from the debris is that uh, Willie uh, McCool, William McCool, the pilot, was trying to maneuver the vehicle as it uh, uh, broke down. And uh, this is all the different things that we we learn from the accident. Yeah, when um, the when the vehicle loses its ability to control its attitude, they assume that the something's failing, and they do what's called an APU restart. So Willie had that panel, and the switches were set for APU restart, which is an orbit pocket checklist, which is attached to his cuff. So these guys were professional to the very end doing their job because they've been trained in. Northern uh, Texas was a, a very special place, became a very special place for us. The um, uh, initiative a memorial museum for the crew uh, members and uh, their support and their connection with us, with the family was something that was really unusual even uh, uh, to describe. And the miracle of, of the debris is something that we appreciate because, as you heard, um, tons of pieces were, fell from the sky and none of the civilians was hurt. And I can uh, appreciate one of the, the artic artifacts that uh, survived the crash and land in, uh, in North uh, Texas that uh, was found two months after the accident. And um, it was very special because it was Elon's diary, space diary, that he was written in space, and it was recovered two months after the accident in April. And uh, with this uh, writing, we were able to learn about what Elon felt in space and what he really wanted to share with us that was so special. And uh, this uh, uh, pages is staying in Jerusalem in the museum, 
and we made a beautiful replica from uh, that area. But as John said, it was, it was a muddy um, area. It was very, um, with rough um, condition to look at for, for debris. But it is a miracle that nobody was hurt on the ground. This is the mission evaluation room. Whenever, whenever there's a problem with the space shuttle or space station, we farm the problem out into the mission evaluation room. This has got hundreds of terminals, and these are all experts. And one of the responsibilities of a flight surgeon is when something like this happens, and it's in the Red Book, you go around and make sure folks are okay. And um, these people were working madly. When I went in there, there's one console called TPS, which is a thermal protection system. And one of those guys was throwing up into the garbage. He, he knew it was his system that failed. Um, one other thing, the people in the payload operations center, the POC, were scientists who loved this crew. And they were extremely distressed. They were crying and wailing. And they couldn't leave the building because they're in lockdown. And uh, I, phoned, uh, I, I, I phoned Chris Flynn who's from the Behavior Health Group, I said, you, don't, you, you need to get your troops in here. You can't get into mission control and lockdown, so set up shop in the cafeteria. And I finally went to the flight director, because as the flight surgeon, you're allowed to go in and out of a lockdown mission control. And I went to, the, I went to Leroy, and I said, Leroy, we gotta get the folks out of the park. It's a mess in there. And uh, we got a lot of them into the cafeteria where the behavioral support people could help them, because they were so distressed. You know, when you're in this business in NASA, we all know we can, bad things can happen. And, it, you know, we, we signed up for it, but these poor scientists didn't. Um, hey, Doug, we're coming up on time. We should probably head okay. to some of the memorials, maybe. Within a day, and this got much, much bigger. When when the soldier handed in the flag, the clicking of the cameras was deafening. There were so many reporters there. Okay. This is a private family conference. John, maybe you could tell us what's going on here. Twice during the mission, um, you, you're allowed a family conference. It's a video conference, two-way video conference like this. And so what, uh, uh, it's a very special time for the, uh, you know, the astronaut to talk to his family and particularly the kids, you know, they love that. Um, because they're, uh, you know, um, you know, like their parents, usually the men would, you know, be able to eat M&Ms and go twirl around in space or whatever. And so it was really, you know, a very special time. And uh, it was really an a, a unfortunate situation that the videos for these were not recorded. And so Doug's team had to go back in and took months to get basically take all this raw data and try to reconstitute the family conferences. Um, because this was all we had left, and it was really, uh, actually, even watching it now, it gets me kind of sad. Yeah, it took us a year and a half. There were three engineers, and we did it at night. About 5,000 lines of code. And reconstructing it was so th therapeutic for me, knowing that we're going to give this to these families. Of all the missions not to do this quite, well, why this one? He's a saber-toothless tiger. He'd lost his front teeth, you know, as... Uh, Good trick. Mom, I'm never the same favorite toothless tiger. Okay, well, uh, you can check it out for yourself when I get back and I see you. Yeah, when I get back and I see you, I get a scream. You want to go to Florida? 
That's the last time they spoke to Laura. So, private medical conferences are very confidential. We don't release them to anybody, but I got permission from the astronaut office to reconstruct the uh, private medical conferences too, which were also lost. Uh, that took us another year. And we took all the medical stuff out. And we found, you know, with this mission, Smith Johnson was, was just a, a funny guy. And the crews loved him. Smith was a flight surgeon uh, for the mission and was very close uh, friend with the, with, the, with the crew. They were trained in the same uh, course, most of them. And they were um, very, very close to uh, Smith. And I guess there was a lot of funny... Oh, yeah. So we'd get the medical stuff out of the way real, real quick. <laughs> and then Smith would get into it. So Smith is going to invite a mystery guest. And the mystery guest is Kent Rominger, who we call Rummel. And Rummel was the commander when Rick husband was the pilot. And so now um, Rummel and Rick are sort of competing about everything. At the end, they're going to make a bet as who, who lands the shuttle better. Uh, so this is basically the guest. And the, please don't be offended, but they tell blonde jokes. So I, I edited them, all of them out except for one. And, uh, <laughs> and then, so they try and identify who the mystery crew member, or the, the mystery person is. Again, it was very therapeutic doing this. Okie dokie. Um, Elon, you look great. You had a, you and the, your red team had a great picture with Errol Sharon in the, in the Houston Chronicle today. So, and you had some really great words. They, they took some of your really best quotes and you've been, uh, you've all been making the press really, really, really looking good. Hey Smith, if, if you're going to uh, play a whole show tomorrow, I'm gonna, piss, I'm gonna be pissed off you. No, 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 I will not play horseshoes without you. In fact, the net, when you guys, after you come down and land, we're gonna have a big horseshoe party, okay? Yeah. And I think we're going to have a first on this mission. It looks like uh, we may have uh, Dr. Clark working the console uh, some this weekend, uh, and also Dr. Clark up in orbit. So that'll be a very first time occasion. So we're looking forward to, to having that happen. All the families are doing great, everybody, and uh, things are going really, really well. All right, thanks, Kelly. We appreciate it. Sure, it's good to see your smiling face. All right, talk to you later. You know what? I feel more now like I did than when I first got here. <laughs> hey, John, how are you doing? Very, very good, and you guys are making us look good, too. Hello. Well, we're just working for you guys. You're the guys who set it all up so that we could uh, put it into execution, and we really appreciate it. It's going very well. Thank you very much from all the team. Well, you're welcome, and uh, thank you for all your hard work as well. Hey, yesterday when we were asking him what he wanted for dinner, he said he'd have some salmon and some french fries, and we're all like, oh yeah, we'll do that. Right. Yeah, sure. Well, we've got some cheese tortellini in the oven. You ought to be up here for it. Actually, that stuff's pretty good. Uh, you guys got burned out in the food yet, or are you still hanging in there? No, we're hanging in there, I think, uh, for the most part, and uh, we've been real, real pleased with a lot of the, we've got a lot of new stuff in the thermal stabilized uh, department. And uh, you want them brought along some kosher food, too, that's really good as well. Oh, good. So that stuff's great because you can heat it up, and then if you decide you don't want it, you can, you know, it's, it's not going to go bad on you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really want to be up here, so. You guys take care. Happy hey, hang on just one second. Sure. I think we can get all seven of us in the field with you. Oh, that'd be great. This is a close, this is a close crew. Hi, Mike. 
That's one of the uh, science directors. <laughs> Hi, Mike! <laughs> They're just stupid smileitis. Oh, uh, you guys look great. This is wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you a bunch, and uh, we'll see you later. <laughs> Take care. See you guys. See you. Any other comment? Yes, Smith, Elon wants to talk to you about a medical problem. Okie doke. Hey, Smith, I have a uh, ground disease. I can't, uh, I can't land on time. I have uh, to recover at least three more days. You need that much I time? I mean, uh, post our uh, scheduled landing. I'll try to talk to some people who I know they're kind of very important people around NASA. I'll do what I can to to chat with them about that, and I'll pass that on to the flight director that you, you need some more time to sleep and, and recover before you come back. I'll, I'll make sure that happens. But uh, other than that, uh, just make sure... Uh... All righty, we'll do it, and uh, take care. Okay, Rick. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> See you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Bill. All right, later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> this is uh, Laurel's funeral at Arlington. Very moving. Uh, we had to go to Arlington quite a few times for this mission. So, at this stage, we're going to have some questions from the audience. Well, we'll have to go to our producers and see if we have time for that. Yes, they're nodding yes. All right. Okay, so uh, if anyone has a <clears throat> question for the panel, please raise your hand. Uh, First of all, thanks a lot for, uh, for your coming here and for this uh, panel, which was not only very interesting, but also very emotional. And I remember I was in the 11th grade when, uh, when the disaster happened, and I remember that day like it was yesterday. So um, it's, it's really special, even for me personally, to meet you. And uh, my question is uh, for Rona and Jonathan. Uh, it's a bit of a personal question, so you don't have to answer if it's too personal, but um, does the fact that you made a contribution to mankind with your loss, that, you, that your sacrifice uh, somehow was for the greater good, does that uh, in any way uh, diminish the pain that, that you feel as a result of the loss, or is the loss sort of constant and that doesn't really uh, change that a lot. So thanks again. I, I guess I have to answer that because Rona, I do whatever she says. I do love you, Rona. You know, the bottom line is that, um, you know, death is part of life. And I think um, you, uh, you realize that, especially in certain, you know, as a military guy, I'd gone to a lot of, of uh, my comrades' funerals, but. I think that um, it does give me some sense of um, uh, fulfillment to, to know that the sacrifice that my wife made had some positive outcome. I look at the wonderful work that the Ramon Foundation has done and is doing for Israel and space and passing the torch to the kids in the next generation. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was a preventable death, but it wasn't a senseless death. And, and I think it does give me some, uh, some sense of uh, relief to know that their sacrifice was not in vain. So I, I say, yes, it does. Does it mean the pain is any less? No, but at the end of the day, I am proud for what they did and, and, the, and that we can carry their legacy on. What you saw uh, in those movies is really a special uh, special people with special uh, relationship between them and I, I do believe with all my heart that uh, 
the legacy is, is, is their inspiration. And the smiles and the blink in the eyes and, and all the excitement that there was at that day in, the, in orbit, there, this is what we need to, to aim and, and remember from, from that. Of course, the lessons of, uh, of the accidents are very important and there were a lot of lessons that been learned. But uh, as, a, as a people that made their remarks in humanity, this is what we aim uh, their legacy to be. And uh, the beautiful side of it, that they, each family took a different uh, route with the, with the memorial uh, activities. Uh, for Rick's husband, um, there's a beautiful um, airport in Amarillo, Texas, the, the city that he was born in. Uh, for uh, Willie McCool, will, uh, and, uh, each dedication is also reflecting in, to their character. So it's, it's really beautiful to see that uh, William McCool, that we, he was a very good athlete and a wonderful pilot as well. Uh, they um, commemorate his honor in the Annapolis uh, Academy. How they it's call it? it's the yeah, the, the uh, cross country track. You know, right. That he was, he was a cross country runner. Annapolis in. Um, yeah, the Naval Academy. In the Naval Academy. As uh, for uh, Mike Anderson, there was also a, an airport that was uh, open in. Yeah, in Washington State. Washington State. And, and um, for a uh, Kolkata Chawla in India, there's a, a scholarship program that uh, is held um, after her name. And. Um, there's a new initiative of uh, educating and st stimulating uh, the young uh, girls in India to go to learn uh, science, which is really beautiful. As for Laurel, you want to talk a little bit about them? Well, I mean, just the stuff that we've been doing to make the next... For the, for the scholarship the, uh, program. As there, well. There's a scholarship program and uh, Earth Camp, and then also the crew survival uh, projects. Course, yeah. John dedicated his work and research on the um, suits and, and the um, safety of the suits, which you can really give a whole lecture about it. Uh, Mike's family, um, excuse me, Dave's family. Dave was a um, um, photographer and he really loved to document uh, things. So he really documented the whole training process of the crew. And in orbit, he continued uh, documenting and filming the whole crew. And his family gathered the whole information and all the, the knowledge and put it uh, together as a beautiful movie about uh, the Columbia uh, crew members. And as for us in Israel, we um, established a foundation that uh, deal with space. We started with the stimulation of, uh, of children because space is such a fascinating uh, subject in, in any age. And we started it with a wonderful collaboration with the Science Ministry and the Space Agency over here. And of course, our friend at NASA and other space agency that comes every year for a special week for a few conventions that we're holding. And even the fact that you're here today is one of the things that we appreciate in there to continue the legacy of Elon and the crew. So there's a lot of activities that we're doing in the educational uh, section. And in the last few years, um, I really wanted to do something for the whole uh, crew as, as, a, as they were, as a crew. And we established here um, a program which we call Space Lab. In Israel, it's the Ramon Space Lab, and outside of Israel, of course, it's the Columbia uh, Space Lab. Each mission is dedicated to one of the crew members, which is really important for me, that the children will know who the people are, and not only by their names, because they were very special people, people, as I said. So this initiative is started, it's gonna be um, uh, implemented now in the United States, I have all the, the support of the family members and the astronaut office, of course, and other uh, uh, organization with it. And we're hoping that this uh, program, the Columbia Space Force, 
lab will be a bridge between groups of youth, curious and bright, that will bring a new experiment to space and uh, will be able to create a mutual language between the different groups that they are participating in this program. So this is how I see the future with the, the legacy of the Columbia group. And we'll see a little clip on, on your foundation here in just a few minutes. Uh, but maybe there's time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the Ramon uh, Foundation for allowing many Israelis to come to SSP this summer. Um, uh, my question is for Director Conley. If you could also please tell about the two pilots who participated in the rescue operations and are not usually mentioned along with the Columbia story. Uh, well, uh, there were a lot of pilots involved in the, uh, in the recovery. Um, um, we used uh, both fixed wing and, and helicopters to, uh, to scan much, much of the area in the margins outside where the people were on the ground. And unfortunately, during that process, we did lose one helicopter crew to an accident. So that was an unfortunate um, um, accident within an accident, I suppose. And um, we, we remember those people just as, though we're, they, just as though they were part of the crew as well. Uh, because everyone is out there to try to find out what, what happened to Columbia. And, um, you know, 22,000 people uh, contributed to that. And unfortunately, in the process of that, we, we did lose one air crew. All right, is there uh, one more question, perhaps? Um, hi, thank you so much. Like, it was really, really, really moving to hear the human stories. Thank you so much for being here and giving us the opportunity to learn more about um, the accident. My question is, so you mentioned um, lessons learned. So what has NASA and its um, international partners learned from this accident and how have um, policies changed moving forward to ensure something like this doesn't, ha sorry, doesn't happen again? Thank you so much. Well, I guess I have to answer that one. Um, well, I, I was involved in the investigation. We, there's three, um, there's the Columbia Accident Investigation Board report, which is like seven volumes. There's a, a Columbia Survival Investigation Team report, and the one we just did, which is actually the one that I would, was uh, heavily involved with and very, it's very sensitive, which is the aeromedical analysis of, you know, how the crew died and how we go to the future. If you'd like, I can give you a, uh, the links and send them to you electronically. Um, the fact is, we, we do learn from our mistakes. You know, that's why we have seat belts in cars and airbags and, uh, you know, uh, car seats for kids and things like that. Because somewhere along the way, something happened and we go, ooh, that was, you know, we can do better. So the, um, we don't have space mishaps very often. Um, the, we've had, a, you know, in the U.S., we've had three. We had, well, not counting Apollo, which was a ground mishap, but we had an X-15 mishap, which is in space, and two shuttles. And the uh, Russians have had two space mishaps as well. Um, and they only, they happen, a, they ha they've happened so far apart that we don't really remember them. And then when they do, we have to relearn lessons. But I can uh, tell you that there's been a, a, a huge amount of things that have improved. And so the crews that are training now to go to space and the ones that are in space are in a much better and safer position because of what we've learned. Um, and I could get into the specifics, but I know we have a reception afterwards. So if you ha afterwards, I can give you more detail, a, a, a painful amount of detail. So I've got a Careful lot of, what you ask for. Yeah. All right, I, I think with that. Uh, Sorry, I jumped the gun. With that, let's uh, thank our, our panelists this evening. To fly and uh, These men and women assumed great risk in the service 
to all humanity. אתה מרגיש שבאמת, כאילו, הצלת את החיים, אתה עשית משהו משמעותי, משהו בערך. קרן רמון הוקמה בדמותם של אילן ואסף. בשנים האחרונות הפכה הקרן ממפעל הנצחה מפואר למנוע של שינוי אמיתי בחברה הישראלית. אנחנו מעודדים עשייה חברתית, מצוינות ומנהיגות, כל זאת באמצעות עולמות התוכן של מדע, תעופה וחלל, עולמות תוכן מעוררי השראה, שגורמים לילדים לשאוף ליותר, לחלום ולהגשים את החלומות שלהם. בהתחלה אני לא אמרתי שאני אתקבל לתוכנית הטייסת. תוכנית הטייסת בשבילי זה מצוינות אישית וחברתית. מועדון הטייסת נתן לי הרבה מאוד ביטחון, ביטחון עצמי, שאני יכול להאמין בעצמי. למדתי לעבוד קשה ושצריך להשקיע כדי להגיע להישגים. הדברים שאני למדתי וקיבלתי, אלה דברים שילוו אותי לכל החיים. אתה לומד להיות הטוב ביותר, כמו שאילן ואסף רמון היו. בדמותם של אילן ואסף רמון, הילדים מציבים לעצמם יעדים גבוהים יותר ושואפים למצוינות. שיתוף הפעולה עם חיל האוויר מעורר השראה. לא כל ילד זוכה להכיר טייס. הטייס הוא מודל לחיקוי עבור הילד, הוא דמות חיובית שמלמדת ומעצימה לאורך כל הדרך. פה כיתה ט' ילדים בסך הכל, ואומרים לנו אתם הולכים לשלוח ניסוי לחלל. בכל נושא שאתם תרצו ותבחרו ותחקרו אותו, יש לכם הזדמנות. רק כשאתה שולח אותו לחלל אתה באמת מפנים ומבין את התוצאות וההשלכות של 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 וואלה, עשיתי משהו. באמת שלחתי ניסוי. זה נותן לילדים חשיבה מסוג אחר, מחדד להם את היצירתיות. הם נותנים הזדמנות מדהימה פשוט ש... של פעם בחיים. לתוכנית הגעתי כשאחת המורות פשוט המליצה עליי לתוכנית. הגעתי לרעיון, אמרתי מה שיהיה יהיה, ובסדר, משם זה התגלגל, וראיתי שאני נמצא בתוך הקרן. במסגרת התוכנית אנחנו חווים בעצם הכשרה להיות מנהיגים של העתיד, ואנחנו נפגשים עם המון אנשים משפיעים בחברה הישראלית. אני שמח להיות בקבוצה של אורט רמון, בגלל שזה מעשיר אותי ונותן לי עוד ידע ונותן לי את המקום להביא את עצמי לידי ביטוי. ו... להתקדם על. להיות חלק מהתוכנית זאת גאווה גדולה וכיף גדול להיות חלק ממשפחת רמון. קרן רמון הצעירה הפכה להיות מפעל חיים מפואר. המקיים הלכה למעשה ומחנך ילדים בדמותם של אילן ואסף. דרך פעילות הקרן אני נפגשת עם ילדים רבים בארץ ורואה כיצד הפעילות משפיעה על חייהם. על חיי משפחתם והקהילה בכלל. ממקום של גאווה וסיפוק רב, אני מזמינה אתכם להצטרף אליי. מזווית המבט שלנו כאן בחלל, כשאנו סוררים במסלול של כדור הארץ, אנו מביטים אליכם, ולמולנו נשקף עולם ללא גבולות, מלא שלווה והדר. תפילה בלבנו שהאנושות כולה כאחד תדמיין את העולם כפי שנשקף לנו ללא גבולות ותשאף לחיות ביחד בשלום
Thank you very much. Toda raba. Looking at in a perspective of uh, 13 years, um, it's, it's been a tough journey. It, um, we really felt that our family is, uh, is breaking to pieces and uh, we held on to each other. Uh, in Israel, we know about the Air Force family. And I want to tell you, as a visitor in NASA, for six years after all, but in NASA, it is a space family, and that's the beauty of it. Each one has their own uh, thing that he's dealing with, but this machine is not working with everyone. And uh, you see the love that we, sh we share to each other and the appreciation we have, we have uh, and we continue to have to each other. And each time we're meeting uh, in Israel or outside uh, of the country, we feel that we're keeping our family together and we are enabling even to extend it. In, um, in a way, exactly, the, 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 in a way your visit over here in Israel, uh, we feel that you, you are becoming part of this big family. And I know that each one of you will be ambassador of space, of uh, humanity, and uh, maybe one day we'll be able to implement the program in the whole globe. So thank you so much for organizing this. John, thank you, Ronan. So thank you, everyone. And good night.